And so Stan's giving you a pretty decent introduction to the how of all this. And when our orientation is toward preparing you to meet with investors. And investors have a certain way of looking at the world, and so the filter that we're going to be using is the world that they, they look at things. When an investor, and I'm an investor, Stan's an investor, when, when we hear pitches, there are just a few things that we key in on. The first and foremost is the market. As Stan described, there's dynamics to the market, there's bottoms up approximations of how well you're going to do, there's top down sort of guesses further out about how much money you're going to make and the like. But we want to understand that market. Again, we're probably not expert to anywhere near the same degree that you are because you're doing this stuff. You have to help us understand what the dynamics of that market is. One of the key things you can help us understand is how is it you sell into this market? Demonstrate to us that you know what the sales cycle is, how long things take, who in an organization or who as an individual you have to approach, and the manner you have to approach them. Be very, very careful when you're talking about selling a product into multiple markets. Because one of the things that, that we know, and occasionally from our own painful experiences, is that different markets have different sales cycles, obviously. And a lot of times as an entrepreneur, we think, oh, we're just selling the same thing. Well, selling to a consumer is very, very different than selling to an institution. Is, is a, a consumer pretty much makes a decision in the standard way that they buy things. Institutions can take a long time, they can take a short time, it really depends. You have to understand and appreciate what that market's telling you. The second thing that as an investor that I'm going to be keenly focused on is validation. Have you actually gone out and demonstrated that anybody wants this thing that you're selling? Is the very best way to demonstrate validation is something we call sales. Go out and show me you've actually sold the thing. Then I know there is at least one person or one company or one institution in the world that found this valuable. And if you have two, that's even better, because if you have two, then it's even more likely you'll find a third one and a fourth one, et cetera. The third thing that is absolutely key for all of us, and the thing that you will learn if you, how, depending on how far you get with the, with the uh, process of asking for money, is it all comes down to the team. They are not investing in the latest and greatest product or service. They are not investing in a huge market with billion dollar market caps. They are investing in you. It is incumbent upon you, therefore, to demonstrate that you are worthy of their trust and their money. That is the key. There is only one thing, or well, there's lots of things you can do wrong, but the one thing you must do correctly is you must be honest and you must be straightforward with it. They do not tolerate, we do not tolerate, being led astray or over-promising or hiding things from us. Once we find out you've broken that trust, your career as an entrepreneur, at least with these firms, are pretty much over. You need to have realistic expectations. And this is a very, very tough thing to do. Because many times you want to be very, very conservative. One of our favorite expressions when we're sitting out in an in, in audience considering investment is when the entrepreneur gets in the front of the room and says, these numbers are conservative. We all chuckle because you're trying to predict the future. If you were any good at predicting the future, you would take a dollar, go to the local liquor store, and buy a lottery ticket. We know you are not very good at this, so it makes no sense to say something like, we're being conservative. Be realistic. I mean. Take an appraisal, look at the market that, that you're doing, bottom up for the first couple of years, top down for the, for the last couple of years, come out somewhere in the middle for the, for the third year, and be realistic about what your expectations are. This is where, again, validation is pretty key, because you know if whatever you're selling, someone is going to value at the price that you're, you're looking to sell it. One of the things that we also like to do as investors, we like you to be coachable. So oftentimes, and what you will discover on the 16th and 22nd, we're going to make some very helpful suggestions. 
is it would behoove you to take those suggestions to heart because it is a way of demonstrating that, the, that you are able to work with a person who is giving you money or coaching or insight. And entrepreneurs that learn are, are a very sweet commodity for an investor. We really want to be able to help you succeed. Many of the times, and the angels are a prime example of this, VCs not so much. Many of the times we do this um, not because of compensation or anything else, we do this because we love helping entrepreneurs be successful. And if you ask me why I do what I do, it's because this is the most fun I've ever had in my life, is working with bright people who want to make something positive happen. And so that's the feedback, that's the compensation that I really get from working with entrepreneurs. You want to have an unfair competitive advantage. And I know in this, this day and age where fairness is all the rage, I want you to have an unfair competitive advantage. I want you to have something that nobody else can easily replicate. And whether that be partners, whether that be technology, whether that be the team that you're assembling, um, you need to be able to demonstrate that there is nobody that is going to be able to compete with you along lines that matter. Do not believe for one minute because you put a lot of time and effort into a product or service that there isn't somebody, if it is simple as spending money, who couldn't come along and replicate that. There will always be people out there with a whole <coughs> lot more money. That's right, referred so. to in the business as a barrier to entry. And that barrier to entry can be your intellectual property. Again, it can be strategic relationships. It can be sales that, that you've made to, to partners. Uh, it can be partnership arrangement. It can be trade secrets. Um, these things are things we commonly refer to as, as barriers to entry. entry. Uh, some are more valuable than others. Uh, certainly uh, patents are, are always sort of a preferred method that, that many investors look at in terms of uh, a significant barrier to entry. It really depends on the, on the type of patent. Um, Stan talked briefly about the financials, what I refer to as the funny pages in every business plan. Um, is they are important, they need to be up there in the front of the room. Uh, you don't, don't, um, you have to do a really, really good job of preparing a financial, financial model. The key to doing these things really, really well is to have your business model aligned very, very tightly with your financial model. We have to understand when you say that we're going to have sales that look like a hockey stick, we're going to want to know what impetus that you put into that and reflected in your finances that is going to cause that inflection point, that is going to cause things to go up. If you show an expense that is going just linearly and all of a sudden the market for whatever reason decides to go into the stratosphere, and the asymptote, to use one of Bob Hammer's words, is that that you know, is highly unrealistic. So you have to do something in order to get a response and it's just not being pretty and showing up. That works in the movies, doesn't work in entrepreneurship. And the last thing that Stan touched on, and it's, and it's really key, is even though most of the angel groups, and, and to a certain degree all the VC groups, are, are in it to help you, want you to be successful, there is this thing about money, um, that all the angels' wives would <laughs> wish that they didn't invest as much as they did in bad things, and wish they invested more in good things, but there's always an exit. And it is key for you to understand that when they look at these things, they want to know what the exit is. So if you get in the front of the room and you say, this is going to be a great ongoing business for 20 years, and I'm going to buy a nice house in Hawaii as a result of it, you are not going to get a lot of traction with an investor. In five to seven years, they want to know when they're getting their money back, and they're going to want to know what significant premium that they're going to get. If you are very, very early in the game, that is that you've got you're at concept development, is they're going to expect a return of probably seven to ten times their money. If you are a little bit later, you have a lot of validation, if, if, if you have de-risked the project to any great extent, then they're going to be looking for four to five times, but in a shorter time period. That means that you have pretty much established that you are going to be successful. Um, that's it. Uh, again, You've got us in the front of the room, you want to ask questions, now would be a good time. One other thing that when you're doing 
a longer investor pitch, say the 15 minute version rather than what we'll be doing for purposes of this uh, presentation competition, uh, use of funds is another issue that, that could be discussed. So that if you're asking for a half million dollars, you know, what are you going to be doing with that? Are you going to be hiring five developers and getting an office and buying a Maserati? Uh, or are you going to be scaling your business by getting sales force together, expanding your brochures, and you know, launching your company out and you know, for the, the big hockey stick returns that the you know, investors hope to get? They just want to understand that you're going to be you know, using good business practices and using their money wisely to grow your business so that everybody gets the benefit of a nice return. And so that's something else that you need, you need to focus on. It doesn't have to be uh, specific to every dollar, but even percentages, or at least the topics of what you'll be spending that money on. Any questions? Keep it. So on the 16th and the 22nd, you want us to come ready with slides and a presentation in, in draft form? That would be a good idea. We'd, we'd like to hear your five minute pitch. Five minute pitch. Yeah, five minutes. You should be ready to make the presentation. Okay. And we will ask you to send them to us in advance. If you have them, I know none of you will. I, I shouldn't even say this. But <laughs> if you could send them to us in advance, that would be good. Jill's already got hers. She's yeah. passing for it. <laughs> Is it a good idea to uh, have a 15 slide, 15 minute presentation? sort of rough and master, and then kind of scale it down to a five minute and scale down the number of slides? Or is it better that you prepare separately as a five, five slide, five minute versus 15 seconds? It's a very good question. Um, it's just like in the old model that we always followed was as you create a you know, 50, 60, 80, or however many page business plan, and you spend your months working on that and the feasibility study and all of that. And then from that you create an executive summary, and from that you create your pitch. Um, very few people do that today. In fact, investors don't even look at, at business plans. They just don't have the time. But having said that, it doesn't mean that you don't have a plan. You do. And what we look for is the executive summary, along with a PowerPoint presentation that gives your business plan. So obviously very concisely, and something that can be followed along with. Now, as far as a long and short presentation, you might follow the same thing as the traditional. It, it might be easier or even so you can make sure you have everything complete into a 15 minute pitch. You should always have something like that prepared anyway. You know, so you're always ready to give, you know, when the guy comes up after you say your elevator pitch is, hey, come on over to my office tomorrow. I'd like to hear more about what you guys do. You're there. And certainly having shorter versions of it is always good. And just like you have a three minute pitch or a, one, a 60 second elevator pitch or your 15 to 20 second elevator pitch. And you just have them so you can just whip them out as needed. It's a very, it's a very interesting question because it, it, it talks a lot about the approach of the entrepreneurs. Usually, usually entrepreneurs and people who start a business have this you know, Grand Canyon sort of view of, of what they're going to do. I once heard somebody who was pretty good at raising money said the process is exactly the opposite. Because he starts with the pitch. And then the pitch is sort of the de minimis that you need to convey. And from there it gets expanded into an executive summary. And from there it sort of gets expanded in, into the business plan. So I, I think from a matter of focus is it really is, is what is the, the key attribute, the key value proposition And then it sort of builds from there. Creating an effective pitch is really, really difficult. Is but the method that we use to do it is we start with a we start with a large canvas that's already painted, and we try to then pull out that scintilla of information that is significant. I think I'd start from the opposite. 